Great. Uh, so welcome, everyone. Good evening. Uh, thrilled to have all of you here. Um, you know, it's absolute delight for us at IMI to uh, be hosting sure. Sir Martin Sorrell. Thank you, uh, Martin, for joining us. We are uh, thrilled to have you here. I also wanted to thank all of you for coming on a holiday. I know it's a holiday in Bombay, so it's great to uh, have all of you join us. So, Martin, we have a combination of leaders of internet companies, mobile companies in India, as well as a number of CEOs of brands and several CMOs uh, in the room. So they're all looking forward to hearing from you. Just in, in terms of how we're going to run this, uh, I'm going to spend maybe about eight to ten minutes uh, sharing uh, a few perspectives on where we are with the internet in India. So those of you who are from uh, the IAMI obviously know exactly where we are with the internet, as well as some of the trends uh, that we're seeing. Uh, and then we'll have Martin uh, share his perspectives on, uh, on a whole set of topics from India to digital India to digital media and so on and so forth. And then I'm going to ask a few questions and then open it up for all of you. So I'm sure all of you have lots of exciting questions that you'd like to ask, ask Martin. So let's start with uh, where we are with the internet in India. Um, and we have about 200 million, actually over 200 million uh, internet users in India. It took 10 years for India to go from 10 million users to 100 million users. It took three years to go from 100 million to 200 million users. And as we speak, India is adding over 5 million new internet users a month. So at the current growth rate, uh, which actually is accelerating month on month, but even if you assume the current growth rate, India will surpass the US in terms of total active internet users sometime over the next 8 to 12 months. Right? So the US is about 270 million connected internet users will surpass the US. And at the current trajectory, India will have 500 million connected users by 2018. So we will have the same level of reach in terms of uh, number of Indians being reached that TV does today uh, over the next four years or so. Right? So clearly, uh, the internet today is reaching a fair number of Indians. Now, obviously, in a country with 1.2 billion Indians, you know, uh, some of my colleagues in, uh, in, uh, who, are, who are marketeers as well as in other media say, what's the big deal with 200 million? I think the big deal, as all of us know, with 200 million is if you look at the consuming class of India, which is the, the number of Indians who consume anything other than basic food products or mobile voice, that number is actually about 250 million to 300 million. So anybody who buys cars, smartphones, televisions, and so on and so forth, um, really is in that 300 million users sort of population. And that population today is reached, reached through the internet. A couple of very important trends. I think the first and most important trend is mobile. Over half the internet users in India today, uh, Martin and everyone, as most of you know this, only access the internet through mobile device. And 100% of the 5 million new users are only accessing the internet through a mobile device. India today already is the world's largest, if you look at large internet markets around the world, is the world's first mobile, truly mobile first internet market. Because more than half the users are only access to a mobile device and 100% of the growth is actually coming from mobile, mobile India. So mobile is clearly sort of a big trend. You know, the other interesting trend that we've seen over the last, I'd say about two years, is this you know, massive propensity of Indian consumers to research online. 80% of Indians who buy a smartphone in India today have already decided which brand and which model to buy before they walk into a retail. Research online, purchase offline. Even in an industry like auto, which one wouldn't think is, 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 uh, is as evolved in India, over 60% of Indian consumers who bought a car have actually done extensive research online before they've gone into a dealership and obviously bought, bought a car online. So, so that's actually quite interesting. And, and what we're actually seeing in India is the propensity of Indian consumers to research is actually more than the Americans. And I think it's, it's largely driven um, uh, by our ability to really know, especially price features. We like to compare everything, right? We are, we are the ultimate negotiators, the ultimate price comparisons. And, and, and so it's not surprising when you think of it that way, but the pace at which this research online, purchase offline phenomenon has taken off has been very, very interesting. Closely tied to that is e-commerce. Uh, six years ago, we had no e-commerce in India, product commerce, you know, electronics, apparel, baby products. Flipkart just crossed two billion of revenue run rate, uh, the largest e-commerce company in India. And what's very interesting is now we're seeing companies launch brands online. So Motorola, when they came back to India, launched Moto G only on Flipkart 
and has had the most successful smartphone launch in the history of India, and India today is the fastest growing smartphone market in the world. Right? So you're seeing actually some very, very interesting things happen. So e-commerce, we think e-commerce, product commerce this year will be about four and a half, five billion, and we're on track to be at $40 billion industry by 2020. So we're seeing not only research online, but consumers transacting. And then the other things that we're seeing are, you know, are, are probably obvious when you look at a market that is as large as India from a user base. Uh, socials exploding, Facebook's crossed 100 million users. What's also interesting is for every single social platform in the world, LinkedIn, Twitter, Google+, and even new ones like Truecaller, India is the second or third largest market in the world already, right? Uh, video, despite all the constraints we have, you know, we have very little bandwidth in India, I'm sure you've noticed if you've tried to access video sites, despite some of the constraints that we have, video is exploding. YouTube, which was 10 million users three years ago, is now over 60 million active users, you know, adding significant number of users every month. And lastly, what, one of, probably one of the more interesting things we're seeing is small businesses are coming to the internet in the thousands. India only has 10,000 advertisers who advertise on television every year. 10,000 companies advertise on television. About 7,000 Indian companies advertise on radio. Every quarter, India is adding more first-time advertisers to the internet than the entire TV industry in terms of number of advertisers, right? So, so the first time that most of India will advertise, even that we have 47 million small businesses, will actually through the internet, not surprisingly. So, so clearly we are at scale, we've got lots of very positive trends and all of that is very good. I think what we can do better at is, is, is actually make digital advertising core to brands in India, right? So despite all this growth, despite these amazing trends, in an ad market this year, which will be about seven and a half billion, digital will be about six and 650 million. So you're looking at about 8% share of the ad mix when it comes to digital. Digital is growing at 30%. The overall ad market is growing at about 11 or 12%. But clearly, with over 200 million users, digital should be further along than it is today. And, and you know, as we've obviously all of us who spend time in the industry, as we <coughs> look, you know, look at this, it's really driven by the kinds of things that you see in a fast growing but early stage market. You know, capabilities at yeah. clients, capabilities at agencies, and so on and so forth. So that's sort of where we are uh, today, Martin, in t Martin and everybody else, uh, in terms of the internet. I think it's a very, very exciting time. But in many ways, although we have a large user base that's getting much bigger by the day, uh, the consumers are way ahead of where the brands are in terms of how to leverage the internet, specifically when it comes to the traditional brands. I think the exciting thing we're seeing in India is we're seeing massive amounts of innovation and entrepreneurship on the internet companies like Flipkart, across you know, e-commerce, across local businesses and online local businesses. Now those companies are actually very, very advanced. You know, the digital marketing capabilities that we're seeing at the Indian entrepreneur-driven technology companies is as good, if not better, than what we see anywhere else in the world. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to the large traditional base of, of advertisers, whether it's in the consumer products industry or in the auto industry or the banking financial services industry, we have a long way to go in terms of uh, So why, why do you think that is? Because, I mean, at our previous session, uh, Sam Balsara asked the question, you know, what, why what, were, we, were we at WPV playing, placing so much emphasis on digital when in India when 88%, I think, was the figure that he used, uh, I think Srini talks about the budgets being, what do you say, 8%. 8% is so, so 92% according to... Yeah, to I, I think there, there, there are three or four factors, uh, but I'd love to hear from you, uh, Martin, what, what, what you're seeing as well. I think the first is capability. You know, uh, if you look at the capability of whether it's on the uh, creative side. I mean, you know, I, I was watching one of your videos where you says creative awards are directly correlated to margin. Yes. Digital, you know, creatives from India are not winning awards. Mm -hmm. That's a, you know, so, so I think we have, there's a real sort of innovation driven, idea driven capability gap when it comes to digital. I think second, if you look at buying, planning, you know, search marketing, social marketing, there's a real dearth of capability. So the, the talent that is there obviously will migrate towards the few companies that are at the forefront as opposed to, you know, if you're, a, if you're somebody who does SEM very well you know, or you do social marketing very well, you're most likely to end up at a flip card as opposed to go to a traditional brand. Yeah, I mean, part, part, part of what you said, I mean, maybe Motorola was introduced because it was Google-owned um, for their introduction. But uh, it's interesting what you say is also about the advertisers who don't advertise, who advertise online and the long tail Yes. Is 
The long tail is, is it, essentially is moving very, yes, very rapidly. Very so rapid. I think cap and capability is one issue. I think the other one really is measurement. You know, the traditional, I think, advertisers, as you, as you know better than anybody else, Martin, struggle with, you know, here's this new medium that's got its own vocabulary, its own set of metrics, yeah. and how do those metrics really, you know, correlate with their traditional set of metrics. So I think measurement is... Well, you went what I call through what I call the sexy phase, where <clears throat> it would be you and Facebook and, and latterly Twitter, where CMOs got excited about it. In fact, you know, it's like if you hired IBM or indeed J. Walter Thompson, you would never get fired. Right. We used to be the same. So you'd never get fired if you spent some money with Google or you spent some money with Facebook or Twitter if you were CMO. And you have to remember the average life of a CMO in the US is two years. So, so they're under some pressure. Uh, also, the, the absolute cost being less than 30 seconds on TV or whatever it is, stimulated people to replace spending offline with the respend, with spending online. So I would say that's phase one, what I call the sexy phase. The, 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 the realism coming to grips phase is the second phase, which we're sort of going through at the moment, which is people, instead of being wanting to throw their money into Facebook willy-nilly, if there is such a phrase in, in Hindi, um, instead of doing it willy-nilly, are looking at it in a more measured way, and that's when the rubber has hit the road from a measurement point of view, and they start to, to look at it. Yeah, absolutely, and I, and I think in India, you know, in many ways, maybe when, you, when it comes to, so, you know, I'm going to separate out performance advertisers from brand advertisers. Yeah. But I think performance, look, if you're trying to drive, you know, leads or you're trying to drive yeah. transactions, it's pretty clear, you know, it works and it works at scale. The third thing, which you're not going to like me saying, but yeah. I'll say it. Yeah, please. Is that I think that advertisers have twigged that you're not really a technology company. That we're a media company. Yes, you're a media yes, owner, you say that as, as, is, as is Facebook and Twitter. And um, I've got to get this one out too. Um, in an era, I said this in the previous session, when transparency is valued so much by clients, quite rightly, I'm not disagreeing, you have zero transparency because we don't know how the algorithm works, and neither do we know how Facebook's algorithm works. So, so it's very interesting, that because that I, I think that's a little bit of phase two as well the realism phase that the initial sexiness has worn off and now it's down to, because internet budgets are 20% worldwide. Worldwide, right, yeah. And maybe so we're less than half in India. Yeah. Right. And then the US is probably around 25 now. The and the UK digital is now bigger than TV? Yes, yes. I mean, it's right. the biggest medium. In fact, Google is the largest media owner. Uh, my, according largest to my technology language. company with lots of revenue. <laughs> we beg to differ on that. But I think that there is a, a realism that's creeping, creeping home on that. So, no, I think uh, there's a lot of trends here, but India's advantage is it leapfrogs the desktop. That's right. So that's right. there's no desktop It's all about phase. mobile. Yeah. That's right. So it goes immediately from the old stuff to, to the mobile stuff. Yeah. So over to you, Mark. Oh, okay, fine. All right. So, so I'm going to do the Modi. I'm going to do it the Modi way, which is occasionally look down at my notes but do it extempore. But we, we took away the, the bulletproof shields. For yes, as well. Because because this yes. is a friendly audience. <laughs> I don't yeah. think we have any competing agents. And I, shall, and I, so shall, I shall go down into the, I shall break the security court and go <laughs> down into the audience. Okay, so um, I don't know what most usefully, what's the brief? The brief is to sort of talk about how we see the digital world. Yeah, I mean, I think, yeah, how's digital evolving around the world? Okay. What's happening in India? Well, let's, let's sort of back off a minute and, and talk a little bit about what our strategy is because you know what we do in digital and of course I'm going to talk from our point of view uh, rather than our competitors point of view or um, other people's point of view so it, the framework is the strategy and the strategy is one sentence it's very simple new markets uh, of which India is one new media data investment management and what we call horizontality so taking them one by one for a minute. Um, new markets, fast growth markets, you went back to the year 2000, 14 years ago, they were probably, let's say 10 or 12% of our business today, they're 30, 31%, and our target is to get to 40 to 45% of our business. And they're growing their market share with us about 1% a year, but this year has been hindered by the strength of sterling, which has pulled them, pulled them back. But basically, they're growing by at least 1% a year, our acquisition strategy is focused almost entirely on the strategy, so they'll grow with that too. So, 
So I would say within five years, uh, fast growth markets, instead of being 30, 31, probably will be getting into the 40%, maybe approaching the 40%. Digital is 36% of our business. Again, if you went back to wow. 2000, zero. Um, and, or we were just getting into it because it was Internet 1.0, which was that, that PR, IPO-driven, right. uh, VC-driven, PR-driven boom, which came to a sticky end uh, around 2002. Again, target is 40 to 45 percent. They're growing their share about 2 percent a year, 1 percent organically, because it's organically a faster growth rate. And then, uh, secondly, by acquisition. And there is no cur or less currency issue because digital occurs in the UK, one of the strongest digital markets in the world. And it's in the harder currency markets like the US and the euro uh, as well. So that's the second objective. The third is data investment management which is highly relevant to a Google, a Facebook, or a Twitter, um, where 25% of our revenues uh, come, so we're, our revenues are $19 billion, and 25% of them uh, come from, or will come from this year, from data investment management. And the quantitative side of our business, digital and data is about half the business, right. is about right. And the fine thing is, the final thing is horizontality, which is getting all our different businesses to work together more effectively, because clients want more integrated, seamless, um, marketing and you know if you take Red Fuse as an example which is our Colgate seamless operation which is here for example uh, here in India uh, that's one of 41 um, client leaders that we have around the world running about 6 billion out of our 19 billion of revenue so about a third of our revenues are coming from these 41 clients so we have integrators and at the country level Ranjan Kapoor here in India and in 50 countries out of the 110 we operate in we have client leaders, uh, country managers, who are also an integrating, uh, integrating force. So that's the background. Now, you have to think about digital, I think, in the context of maybe uh, nine or ten things that we see going on in the world, which I won't go into in any great detail, but I'll just state them, and then if any of you got any um, doubts about the, the, the veracity of the ten things that I'm going to mention, feel free to, to challenge them. But they are fundamental, in our view, in terms of client behavior. And they're fundamental in terms of driving digital change or driving the, the digital change agenda. And the first is something that you know about in India uh, and, and the new prime minister understands, I think, extremely well, uh, which is the shift in power from the west to the east, obviously India and China, but to the south, meaning uh, Latin America, and also to the southeast, meaning Africa and the Middle East. So one is the changing power shift, and that has been exacerbated by the growth of new media and social media, and you see that whether you're talking about Turkey or Gaza or uh, Iran or Iraq or wherever it happens, it happens to be. The second thing is that broadly, in most industrial categories that we operate in and service categories, there is significant overcapacity. You might find this hard to believe, but in the automobile category, our largest client is Ford. In the automobile category, the world can still produce, even post layman. and remember that the big three in Detroit all were in difficulty. Two of them went into bankruptcy and had government money to bail them out, Chrysler and General Motors. Ford was the only one of the big three to resist the allure of government money and, and, and dug itself out of its crisis with Alan Mulally, Mark Fields, Jim Farley et al, um, dug themselves out. Uh, and, and that overcapacity still exists today despite the fact that the big three went through that trouble and reduced the capacity. The overcapacity has come, or the extension of capacity, back to the same level pre layman at 80 million units, has come from India, things like Tata Motors, from China, like Geely, uh, from South Korea, Hyundai and Kia. The, I mean, Hyundai, I think, I regard as being the Samsung of the automobile industry. And to be, f to be fair, uh, some expansion in capacity laterally in Japan, but also to some extent in Western Europe. So you can still produce 80 million units, and consumers can only consume 60 million cars and trucks. Mm. So there's still significant overcapacity in that industry, and I would argue that is increasingly the, the case in most industrial segments. What's really interesting is the shortage, the juxtaposition is in talent. There's 
If you think there's a talent war coming on, stand by. India is a very rare country in terms of its birth rate and increasing population. But even India, at some point in time in the future, will face a declining birth rate like China, like Russia with 145 million people and an aging population. And that puts tremendous pressures on, on the uh, uh, development and economic development of the country. The third thing we see is the growth of the web, which you know well. But I'll just make three quick points about the web. Disintermediation, if you have a legacy business. Disintermediation with a low cost or lower cost business model. And a, lo a business model that is evaluated on different criteria to a traditional legacy model. And looping back to the talent point that I mentioned, internet businesses are far more attractive businesses for young people to join. Less bureaucratic, more networked, more responsive, more exciting, and the age of apprenticeship inside big companies uh, has gone. Fourth area is retailing and manufacturing, and the balance between retailers and manufacturers. And this has high relevance to digital and the growth of digital. We work very closely with IBM. Uh, Ogilvy has developed campaigns over the years, Smarter Planet, Smarter Cities. It's now going through another iteration. But the, the heart of those campa campaigns about the fact, are about the fact that 50% of the world's population already lives in cities. It will be 70% by 2030, whatever the figure is. So the wave of urbanization is going to increase even further. And urban communities are going to become more, they'll become more crowded, despite driverless cars and other, other such things. And driverless cars, interestingly, I drove in the Google car in Silicon Valley two years ago when we had our strategy conference there. And I remember writing to an automobile manufacturer and saying, you'll never guess what I'm doing, but I'm in a driverless car, to which the response was, that's a dangerous thing to do. <laughs> there you go. Which is interesting, because it's the response of a legacy company to a new, a new int uh, innovation. I'd only just say that I heard last week that the British government is going to introduce legislation that will permit driverless cars to be driven on British roads next year. Now, whether those driverless cars will have the capability is another question. The other fascinating thing was, I asked the guy from Carnegie Tech who drove me in the driver's car, because I didn't, because we didn't drive on the freeways on the driver's car, we drove on the side roads. Oh, sorry, not on the side roads, on the, we drove on the freeways, because we, just in case we got into an accident. I said to him, how long did this take to, to develop? He said, 10 years. And I said, how many people? He said, 10 people. Hmm. So if you just think about that for a minute, that 10 people over 10 years at Google as a sideshow developed the driverless car. That was two years ago. We've now got, I don't know, 18 manufacturers of driverless. We've got the Mobileye technology out of Israel, which right. just went public right. in New York, right. which Ford and Volvo use in their cars. Although nobody in our business who works on Ford and Volvo, both of whom we work for, knew what Mobileye was. But they knew the technology because it's the Intel inside problem, as nobody knows what Mobileye is. But it's a good example of disintermediation. So disintermediation, low cost business model, and it loops back to talent and attracting talent. Um, that's the web. On retail and manufacturing, just coming to that for a second. Conurbation, focus, um, um, pollution, um, smaller family sizes. As women come, thankfully, more and more into the workforce, you'll have two earner families. They will have less time to shop. So two things are going to happen. One, proximity retailing is going to become much more powerful. And secondly, e-commerce is going to become much more powerful. Now, that may sound like an obvious one, but you will get a shock if you Google, for example, um, Huggies and Pampers, pen, uh, percentage of sales in the US that are done through Amazon already. And the biggest threat that many of our clients, when I ask them my favorite question, what's the biggest problem? What's the biggest threat? Many of them focus on Amazon. I mean, I had a week in New York and Europe where in one week, a major retailer, a major transportation company, and a major package goods company, when I said, what's the biggest threat? They said, Amazon. So what all this is doing is altering the balance of power between manufacturers and retailers. The retailers have had the power in the last 20 years. Walmart, Tesco, Carrefour with their big box retailing, big distribution, patterns of purchasing have had the, the real opportunity. Now retailers for the first time have the opportunity to reach over the heads, uh, manufacturers have the first time to reach over the heads of retailers 
and go direct to consumers, and consumers can buy things directly. And my belief is that when Alibaba goes public, despite the problems in its film company just uh, in the last 24, 48 hours, that it will achieve a valuation of close to 200 billion and will go north of 200 billion very quickly. Remembering that Google is now, what, 400? 400, close to 400. 400. Um, the most valuable company on the planet if you strip out Apple's cash. True. So I think, Ali remember, Alibaba will probably be around about 200 billion. Remember that Tencent, I think, is 140. Baidu is 60, the last time I checked. Yeah, so some of these Chinese internet companies are very powerful. And I think Alibaba is a game changer. It will also put pressure on Amazon, because Amazon doesn't make money, whereas Alibaba does. And remember that Alibaba has excluded from its IPO two things, a logistics platform and a financial transactions platform. So it's going into the banking business as well. In fact, when I was last in China, the Bank of China put a control in, effectively, that they could only use one branch, I think, of, of ICBC uh, in China instead of all the branches, because they were expanding the right. small business credit through their Alibaba platform, yep. through the Taobao platform, too extensively. So that balance between retail and manufacturing is very important. Internal communications, also very important digitally. Biggest challenge for chairman and CEOs is reaching internal audiences, not external audiences. You know, if we have 178,000 people in 110 countries in multi-branded companies, not single brand, it's very difficult to communicate strategic purpose and structural change. Um, digital also important from the next point as well, the rise of procurement and finance. I bemoan it. I'm an ex-CFO, but I still bemoan it. Clients are too focused on cost. They're not focused enough on growing the top line. But in a, in, in a world that is focused on cost, Digital becomes more and more effective because people are more networked and, it, and it's cheaper. Structural changes inside companies are also driving digital. Global focus, GE, for example, Jeff Immelt, a speech I heard him make <coughs> a few weeks ago, talked to having, about having a more networked and, and digital center. So less cost at the center, but more emphasis. And high emphasis on local as well, because if you operate we operate in 110 countries. Coca-Cola operates in 220. I can't remember what GE does. You need strong local penetration, too. The management is being taken out, however, at a regional level in most companies. We're seeing that in a number of instances. So digital drives organizational change, where you have a strong global center and local, because one of the reasons that's been driven is because of the, of the growth of, of digital. Government. Government post layman has become much more important as an investor, as an intervener, as a regulator. If we think that's going to change, think again. Because the need for government to intervene post, post layman has become more and more paramount. And government could be made of more efficient by digital too. In fact, some of the challenges that you have here in India, yeah. I think, could be solved by, we saw that with Nandan and the Nalakani in the previous administration with the identity numbers, but that's just a little example of what can be done. And the final areas, two areas, uh, CSR, social responsibility, all companies now, without exception, put social responsibility front and center in their strategies. Doesn't affect digital enormously, but it's very important in a digital context too because of communications. And doing good is, good, is as good business is accepted throughout the world. And the last point, which is also affected by digital, is consolidation. If you think that the world has not consolidated sufficiently, just stand by, because in this sub-trend GDP growth world post layman, you're going to see more consolidation of clients. You're going to see more, more consolidation of media owners, both legacy and new. Legacy, in part, to deal with the new. I think what drove Rupert Murdoch to look at Time Warner was in part defensive, it was partly offensive, HBO, sport, sports platform to compete with Disney, but it was also about if you have legacy platforms, how do you compete with a Google and a Facebook and a Twitter, which are media owners, um, how do you compete and you compete by more consolidation. So that's the background. Let me just say a few things about what we're trying to do, just finally, and then we can open it up. The first thing is, if you look at our history with digital, as I said, 2000, virtually nothing, today 
we're two-thirds of the way through our travels, trying to get to 40 to 45 percent, I would say by the time we get to 40 to 45 percent, the world will have moved on such that we will move our objective up even higher. And I say that because there's some very interesting statistics from the United States. Mary Meeker, if you don't look at Mary Meeker's 104 slides from Kleiner Perkins every year, you really should do. You can get it on, you can Google it, just Google Mary Meeker, M-E-E-K-E-R. She does it every year. We work with her historically on some of the statistics. It's, it's, there's no commentary. You just get 100 slides or 104 slides, and you make up your own conclusions. Buried in that, I think it's slide 27, if I remember rightly, is a slide that compares media consumption in the U.S. with where we, on behalf of our clients or with our clients, spend their media budgets. Remember that the average media, uh, the average client is spending about 30, uh, about 20 percent on digital. In the United States, consumers consume, in terms of media consumption, about 46 percent of their time on the internet and mobile currently. And we invest, on behalf of our clients and with our clients, only 20 percent. <clears throat> the other end of the spectrum, in newspapers and magazines, consumers spend 20 percent of their time with legacy newspapers, not <coughs> digital newspapers or tablet newspapers and magazines, but you know, felling trees and distributing newsprint, they spend 20, 6, 6 to 10 percent of their time, depending on whose statistics you believe, and it, but we still invest 20 percent <coughs> in legacy newspapers and magazines. That has to change. And we're already up in the US to 45 percent. So my guess would be by the time we achieve 40 to 45 percent, the, the, the signal post, the signpost will have moved on. And maybe by the time we get to that, we won't make the differentiation between digital uh, and non-digital or online uh, and offline. So that's a little bit about where we were. We have had three approaches to stimulating digital in our side, our organization. So we've had J. Walter Thompson Company, Ogilvy and Mather, Young and Rubicum Gray, those are the four big advertising-led acquisitions that we made in 87, in 89, in 2000, and 2005. We've said to those businesses, for example, or TNS, which we acquired in 2008, make your businesses more digital. We then said to our pure digital plays like Wonderman, or Ogilvy One, or AKQA, or Possible, or whoever, make your digital businesses even more digital. And the third thing we've done is said we were really basically a strategic venture capital company. We will invest in companies like Omniture or Buddy Media or Vice or Full Screen or whoever. And we, we've done about probably about 60 or 70 of these investments, not primarily to make a financial return, but primarily to train up people on these, so Buddy Media, Facebook, uh, Omniture, web analytics, Vice, digital content, full screen YouTube and digital content, to train our people on this and develop our capabilities and make money. So we've had that tripartite approach. And I think if you're in a legacy business, most, most of the people in this room may not be. You may come from the, as started in the digital space. We didn't. That's the, the approach that we made. So I've talked about the usage. And finally, let me just sort of say about how our digital relationships are developing. So our media book is about, in total, $75 billion. RECMA calculates it at rate card at about $104 billion around the world, $102 billion around the world currently. Out of that $75 or $100 billion, our biggest media relationship is with this gentleman on the left, right? So... My global culture. Your global yes. counterpart, yes, this is the... Three the, years, the, yes, we the, will get there. Right, so, so we spend, or spent last year, two and a half billion dollars with Google, which was the same as we spent with what I call the old News Corp, which is the new News Corp plus 21st Century Fox. That has been pretty stable. Google grew from two billion the year before to two and a half, and our target for this year is, is three billion. And I have to say, sparing the blushes of anybody from Google, 
uh, they are superbly organized. They have, they, they have over the years lost good people. I mean, the latest one being Nikesh to Songsan, but, but they have deep bench strength and they have um, an analytical approach to building a business relationship, which I think is quite, quite significant. Now, it is true that I've called and continue to call Google and Facebook and Twitter and others frenemies. And they are friends and enemies, but who in the room doesn't have friends and enemies? I mean, Samsung and Sony are frenemies. People forget that. You know, Samsung supplies Sony with chips, and, and yet, uh, yet they compete very heavily with one another. Now, Google, for example, is a friendlier frenemy today than it was four or five years ago. I hope to some extent because I pointed this out, and that's brought us closer together. But there is a bit of this paranoia um, or Jekyll and Hyde um, sort of bipolar um, uh, concern uh, that we have in agencies because agencies are, are nervous because they have relationships and they're, they're middlemen or middle women and they're worried about who has control of those things. But putting that to one side for a minute, our relationship with Google has grown because we planned it well. They have very good people. We sit down at the beginning of every year. We plan it. We monitor it on a quarterly basis. And we see whether we succeed or fail. Biggest growth just as in India, where we're growing, we're, we're doubling up this year, 100% growth this year, we're forecasting with Google. The reason for that is we sat down and we planned it, we worked together with clients, we developed joint teams to, to, to target clients and explain the benefits, and it's working extremely well. To give you an example of the orders of magnitude with Facebook and Twitter, this year we're targeting, with Facebook, $650 million. And despite the fact that large numbers of Facebook people come from Google, they didn't, if I was being absolutely blunt, and I've said this to Cheryl and others, and it's actually changed, I think, partly as a result of our efforts, but partly because I think Facebook has become more focused um, and more Google-like, if I can say that, actually, in terms of the planning processes. We're targeting 650 million this year, as opposed to about 439 million to be imprecise last year. Twitter was 50 million last year, will be about 104 million this year. So I, I mentioned that AOL is about 400 million, Yahoo is about 100 million, just to give you orders of magnitude. So you get, uh, we will be spending with Time Warner about a billion dollars, with RTL about a billion four, big in Europe. So that gives you some rough ideas of the, the sort of things that we do. And I would say the pattern of growth here in India will be accelerated by what you, you mentioned before. This leapfrogging will put, I think, um, the new media in a strong position. But, and I'll finish on this, you come back to the question that I, which I asked you that Sam said, you know, what are you getting so excited about digital, Martin? Because you know, eight, either it's 82 eight or 92% is um, and one of the clients I was speaking to this morning said, actually, we spend 2 or 3%. There's a 5% subsidy from Global to get us to spend more on, online. So there are some things that we have to do in the measurement area. And we have 25% you know, of our business's data. And we've done a tremendous deal with Twitter, not guaranteeing them a spend, as others have done, which I think is mistaken, but working with them on the data. So we've proven that Twitter is more effective than people believe because we've looked at the consumer engagement data and we've looked at the, the live audience data and compared the two and shown that audience are more, more engaged with live programming as a result not only of watching television but using their tablet or their iPhone or their mobile or whatever. Else. So that's a little bit of background on, on global in particular. Great. Well, I'm going to ask a one or two, sure. two or three questions, and then we'll open it up. So, Martin, you know, um, I, I was just telling Srini this. Every time I talk to him, either you've just been here, yeah. you're here, or you're about to arrive. So you come to India well, more twice. than any other global CEO that I know. I mean, three times a year? Is it two, well, twice? Twice to three. I think I've been here twice already this year. Last year, it was once, to be honest. And they, it's usually about twice a year. That's fantastic, right? Now, now what, what, what surprises me a little bit, now it's great to see the commitment, obviously, being in India. But if you look at China, I mean, they've got a $15 billion digital market. I go market. there six times a year. Six times, yes. six times a year, right. I do go. The, um, you know, what I was going to ask you is, China's, you know, we, we like comparing India yes. with China, I mean, although we 
maybe we shouldn't, but we still do. Um, you know, China's digital market is 15 billion. Our entire ad market is seven and a half billion. Well, I'll give you another st amazing statistic. I think. So, India for us, where we have a very large share, I won't say what, well, RECMA says 42.5%. Uh, and we have $500 million of revenue. Yeah. Uh, and we have 14,000 people. In India. In India. And that excludes the part-times that we have in right. the rural sales forces, you know, because we do a lot of distribution in rural communities. In China, our business is 1.5 billion, three times bigger, we have 16,000 people. So your revenue per headcount is also much, yeah. much higher. Which, so I was thinking maybe I should take that to Mr. Modi and say that this says a little bit about productivity, which I think is, a, which is a, an interesting point. What um, I was going to ask you, Martin, was what's holding our ad market? I mean, our ad market actually is relatively much smaller than, let's say, if you look at a percentage of GDP basis, right? Brazil's ad market is just substantially bigger. It'll, uh, and the answer to your question is it's, yeah. it's, it'll get there. Okay, so you think it's just time? Yeah, I think all these things are a question of time. And there is a Moore's law that operates, I think, which, going back to Sam's question for the third time, I think, because I think it's a very important question, um, that Moore's law is going to catch a lot of people out. So, you know, as Eric has said, Schmidt has said on many occasions, and others, Larry and Sergei, I thought, should have said, Mark and Cheryl have said it, and Dick has said it, and lots of other people have said it, and Jack Dorsey has said it. The, these, these trends, you know, you, you, sometimes you manage to forecast them, but they always happen faster than you thought. So if you said to me, what do I regret maybe about the last uh, 14 years is that, you know, we've done well on the digital front, but we didn't go faster. Mm -hmm. You know, if I had my druthers, I would have done more. There was stuff I thought wouldn't work, or people who I work with said wouldn't work, more the latter than the former, because I don't know, I'm not an engineer. Um, there, there, there were valuations I thought were very expensive, but I was looking at it with an old eye and I wasn't being flexible enough, and there were risks worth taking. So, I mean, some of this is fad and fashion, because I think the other thing that happens on the internet is things come and go faster. So what, you know, MySpace would be the most extreme example of that, but there are other examples of that. Things that we thought were powerful, remember you did your deal with Rupert over MySpace. Right. Within, you know, people thought he was mad to, to pay 900 million, and then bang, he does his, his deal, or whatever he paid for it, he does his deal with, uh, with Google for three years. Um, with an MAU, not a written contract, interestingly enough. Um, so I just think that all these things are gonna move much quicker, so I just think it's purely a question of time. It's also a question of economic development here. Um, and you know, I, you know, to be frank about it, it the Chinese hide poverty much more effectively than India does. Mm. And when you look at India, and whenever I come to India, I mean, I'm not a sentimentalist, um, not highly emotional, but it is, it does make you very concerned. I mean, you know, traveling around the cities, you know, you go to Bangalore, which is clearly one of the internet digital centers of the world, not just of Asia. I mean, when people say, where do the next possible threats or opportunities come, I would say a couple of people in Bangalore are just as likely as a couple of people in Silicon Valley or Silicon Valley in the UK or Sao Paulo. But you go on the Bangalore campuses and you go off them and it's appalling. So you know, part of it has to be, and one of the things I hope that the, the new administration will address, infrastructure redevelopment in the country that will change the economic environment. Yeah. E economic and infrastructure development that will elevate more people into the middle class. I mean, we've scratched just the surface with a couple hundred million or whatever it is in India that have gone into the middle class. To a certain extent, we've scratched the surface in China, but they've got there, I mean, we have to be honest about it, whether we whether we believe it's autocratic, whatever we feel about the political dimensions, from an effectiveness point of view, the Chinese have been immensely effective. And in fact, as I said in the previous session, I think drove India forward in the early 90s. If Deng Xiaoping had not have made his speech, 
if the Chinese development from 1985 to the early 90s had not been so strong and having a tiger in your backyard was not something right. that India felt comfortable about, that focused their mind. You know, it's the old competitive thing. If you have a strong competitor, it tends to give you somebody that you focus on and you build your, you build your business on. So I think it's a little bit about time and it's a little bit about the Chinese, a lot of people say, oh, the Chinese have overbuilt, and I think that's true, but the infrastructure is superb. And if they can get the other stuff right, they're in a phenomenally strong position. But coming back to your point about advertising, India is under-advertised, it's under-branded. Clients say, well, we've got media inflation of 10%, and that's... Of very low base pricing. Yeah, of very low base right. pricing, but you know that may be sometimes a little bit symptomatic of the fact that demand is growing. That's right. And advertising per capita has got a long way to go here. I mean, it should be, in theory, it should be not a $500 million business, it should be a billion five business for us. Right. And by the way, our share in China is 15. We're market leader right. by a long way, but it's only 15. Right. So w one last question, and then I'll, we'll open it up. The, um, as, as an ecosystem, Martin, yeah. what is it, you know, with, you know the agencies, uh, the technology companies, yeah. Google, Facebook, et cetera, we have a large local tech ecosystem. Yeah. Um, what are the two or three things that you think we ought to be focused on to drive the digital transition, you know, make it happen sooner, right? Because, you know, hopefully next, next year when you're here, we've got to say more than, like, it's at 10% now, well, and then 12%, because, you know, we should, like, go to 15%. Hate, what, what, could we, what could we be doing? What well, are we hate, not doing? I hate to be a record, but, but I do think it. See, I think we're, we're sort of um, too anxious. It's going to get there. I mean, it, it's, it's you know, not, a, not just like those boring stories that, you know, I always hate the people who say to me, you should see what my sons or grandchildren do. I mean, you know, it's the usual rubbish, but, but not rubbish, but I mean, it's factually true. But, but if you think about America, I think that America, which is certainly one of the most advanced, if not the most advanced internet economy because of the importance of Silicon Valley, not just in technology, but in environmental Even stuff adoption, and right, yeah. cars and right. things like that. Um, it, this generation that's graduating is the first generation that's lived with the internet from the day they popped their head out of the womb. I mean, that's a simple fact. So it's unrealistic, I think, to believe. These people have not got to positions of control or influence. They will do shortly because, you know, the age, the age thank, thankfully, Younger people are getting more responsibility and through the web itself can create things which have more power and more control. So it's going to happen. I don't think we should get worried about it. <clears throat> the, the fact is if you're running an established company and the CEO and the CFO are pounding you, you know, coming to the end of your budget year and you're behind budget, in, let's say it's a calendar year and it's November and you have to make a, an end of the year push you know, around Christmas time to get it right, what are you going to do? Will you spend more money on mobile search, or on video, or on Facebook, or on Twitter? No. You will go to the tried and trusted, particularly if you're 69 years old like me, or even younger, right? So you'll say, you know, I know Star TV works. I know ZTV works. I know Colors works. Bang, I'm going to use them. And I think we're a prisoner of that. So in an in an environment where there's tremendous pressure, and I referred to the cost pressure because GDP growth isn't sufficient, even in the fast growth markets, which have got slow growth, but they're still fast right. growth markets, I, I think that's the pressure that exists. Okay. So I, I would say relax is going to happen. If only because, you know, when I said to Nikesh Arora uh, at Cannes, our stream conference this year, what's your biggest worry? He said it's not. Facebook and Twitter, and they are worries, but it's not them. It's the, you know, it's the two guys in the, the garage, or the two girls right. in the garage. The innovation. Yeah. Innovation. So that's, 